I got a thing. Welcome to the Podtendo Podcast, where we analyze, reminisce, and replay the glory of old Nintendo games. We can be contacted on Twitter at Podtendo Podcast, email us at podtendo at gmail.com, or check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash podtendo. I'm your host, Mick, and I'll be joined every episode by a special guest. This week's guest is... Tyson. All right, and welcome back. Uh, so, sorry, as you were saying from the last episode, look at Mario compared to Sonic. Um, yeah, so if you look at, like, Mario compared to, like, Sonic and, like, um, take Mario and Link versus, like, Sonic. Mario and Link, when you see those characters, you can clearly see that, like, Mario is a plumber. He's an old guy. He's kind of fat, so he's eating, like, eating his fair amount of stuff. He's obviously done stuff with his life. You can just tell that by looking at him. And you look at Link. Link is a young kid, generally, or a young boy, or whatever you want to call him. Um, and he's basically going to go on that trail for the very first time, so he doesn't have any war wounds. He doesn't have anything. Mario has a belly and a mustache, and he clearly works with his hands. But then you look at Sonic. Sonic is a blue hedgehog. Yeah, there's, and... There's, there's no nothing. There's no, like, oh, you, by looking at him, you can clearly tell that he's... You know, a scientist, nothing. Oh, he runs fast. Why? He's got shoes on. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Like some of those, some of those uh, other, yeah, I guess, I don't know. How, how would I describe it? Sonic looks very, I think Sonic looks sleek. He looks like he can run fast. He looks like a very clean character, right? Like they yeah. built a, when a child draws a character without design, kind of like you're saying, that's what Sonic looks like, right? Whereas Mario, he's a dorky guy in suspenders, right? Like he's not the hero. Link Link moves more towards like what the hero should be, right? The guy in, he's got a sword, he's got the shield, but he doesn't have a lot of armor, right? He wears a cloth tunic. Uh, it's a very simple design, and but, but you can tell, you know, he's young. He's adventurous. You have to grow with him. He doesn't get to start out with the cool helmet with the horns that come down over his face, right? And he's got the tattered barbarian clothes. He looks just like a young fairy boy. And that's kind of like my point. Like, he looks... But that is his character. Like, he has never been in a sword battle before when you generally, when you first see Link, he's never clashed sword with anybody. Generally, it's a go get his sword. So, like, he doesn't have any scars. He doesn't have, like, arm lobbed off or something like that. But if you look at someone like, I was, I was, like, I like saying Panasonic to compare the retro yep. to the retro. But go something newer. Go, like, Drake's fortune or yep. Drake from um drake's fortune uh nathan uh, the Dr- uncharted yeah ethan fortune or whatever Na- no nathan nathan drake drake thank you why where the heck did i pull that name from anyways i don't know um so nathan drake because i'm staring at it on um the sidebar advertisements yep and he actually like as that game has progressed every this. time they it's a new story. He looks more haggard. He looks yes. more like he's like lived his life, and that's yeah. kind of how a character should be. Like Naughty Dog is, they're very smart about how they did this. Then if you look at someone like Tomb Raider, very similar idea, but she was just starting fresh. The new Tomb Raider, the very first one that came out a couple of years ago, was she was just learning her shit, so she didn't have any scars, and this was kind of her first adventure of you need to survive or you die. Period. And that was that entire, like, game. And then the next one, she has, like, a scar on her face from the first one. And just, like, it's it's that progression again. Like, as the games are going on, like, the next one, you see the wear and tear on the characters. Link has never had that. Link always is a fresh start. My only concern with the newest game, which was kind of my original point, yep. is um, it's I'm kind of worried because... We need to start seeing... We need to get a change. It's refreshing. And then, like, after, like, as you see this character change and grow over time, you grow more attached to them. But we never really grow attached to a specific Link. And that's kind of the, that's the beauty of Link, but it's also kind of like the downfall. 
See, um, now I, I, I kind of want to counter that a little bit because my favorite Zelda, I guess I'll spoil it for everyone, is Wind Waker because of the art style, because of how animated that little Toon Link is, right? Like he looks kind of like the cutest version. He doesn't, he hasn't seen anything, right? Like he kind of has that kind of that bedhead going at the beginning, those big bright eyes. And every time he sees something or looks at something, it's, it's, he's seeing it for the first time. He's lived on this little isolated island. And I think that's my favorite Link. So the art style there would almost lead to that kind of that fresh nubile thing going on uh whereas some of the other characters like the twilight princess link looks a little bit older but but that art style that game the overall just does not draw me into it so i i guess like from that sense but it's always supposed to be a a new link as well right like i kind of get that how when they mature i think the Part of the reason with the new art style of Zelda is they went Ocarina of Time and people wanted a gritty, grindy Link and they got this little dorky cartoon guy. And that hurt them in a sense where people weren't going out and getting Wind Waker. It wasn't critically acclaimed. It wasn't until Twilight Princess where people were like, well, finally, Link looks like Link again. I don't know what happened to that little toon dork. Um, Absolutely. But you want to what? People that didn't give Wind Waker a chance missed out on probably the one of the best kind of like Zelda games. It's it's awesome. Like it is. It's you take that whole open world done you're like crawling all over the land or you just put it on the ocean. Yep. Then all of a sudden you got like pirates are running around, there's birds running around, there's secret island, there's sunken treasure. There's like there's so much freaking world out there that had they not gone to that 2D style, it would be exhausting. It would be Absolutely. like, it would have been Sky, it's like Skyrim. Yeah. And to, Skyrim to me is an exhausting game. Like people love Skyrim and all that stuff. But you want to, because the art style is really nice, it kind of kept you energized. Whereas Skyrim, it's vanilla Skyrim, it's looking like dirt. And you have to walk all over this freaking world that looks like dirt because it's the real world and the trees are out there. But it's, it's not really interesting. Yes. Um, whereas, like, the cartoon art style, it's always fresh. There's always something popping on the well, screen, like yeah. bright colored characters. So, yeah, because I, 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 I like that style. Go on. Oh, sorry. In Wind Waker, you'd go to an island and you'd see this big cartoony cave drawn on the side of it, and it would be up on these ledges with palm trees. And you say, "Hey, I got a hook shot. I got hook shot to those trees." You'd get up to the the cave and you'd go in, and it would because you could see it but in Skyrim you'd be on a mountainside and it all looks like rocks dirts and trees and until you have a guide or for some reason if uh, you have I think you can turn on like show or you can buy maps that'll show you different landmarks then you could kind of walk up follow the little crack and cliff and all of a sudden it says spider's web or some or spider's hideout and then you could go in there right so the level of extra and just unnecessary exploration that is put on this giant world because of the realistic graphics is daunting is daunting right whereas the cartoon one it kind of makes sense right like you can make a giant painted on cave to this like very plain looking rock and i think it works better in- and you can guide people by doing that like, exactly that that eases the process that don't you know you just stop go into a menu go to a website you don't need to do that you just literally look at that thing and you're like oh perfect i can just go over there and that's that's the beauty about video games is it's a very visual media so if you don't use the visuals it's wasted yes um and like the original like legend of zelda which is visual like visually not the prettiest you made the point that you you still like it because it kind of leaves it open to your opinion yes but it guides you with when it's open to your opinion so yes i it's not my favorite but it's it's all right in hindsight i guess i was a little too harsh on it to begin with but it's just sometimes you want to look at something pretty and you just spend hours of your life just staring at pixelatedness. This is the first... HD world has ruined me. <laughs> this is the first ever tangent I've ever heard on a podcast about video games that was about video games. So, congratulations us. Yay, we did it. <laughs> we actually had a, a conversation about video games on a video game podcast. Yeah, because most... Rare as that is. It, absolutely. Like, all the ones I listen to, they go on tangents, and it's about other it's things. About and you hear the host being like, come on, guys, let's get back on topic. But we actually discussed the graphics of video games. Weird, eh? Huh. Yeah. Art styles. And how, and how they all compare to each other. I, I mean... Our preferences. I'm kind of confused as to, like, where it came from and why we started talking about it. So it'll be interesting when I go back and listen to it. I'm like, oh, that's the point we're making. So uh, I think I think it was all because of the artwork. And then I just kind of started. Yep. Going on that hole. Yep. And you kind of helped. 
That's it. So uh, this is, I, I probably will do a little thing. This is the second part, uh, second part of the Zelda episodes. So kind of where we left off from last episode, second quest. You didn't play second quest this time around, eh? I did not. Okay. Um, it seemed more hard. And <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't up for the challenge. Yeah, oh, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Uh, so you can two ways. So when you beat the game, you can press select and it will just start you on second quest. Second quest is the world has been moved around. They've shuffled all the dungeons, shops. What else is there? Little gambling side quests and move them all over the map. They put them in different little locations, as well as all the dungeons have been reshuffled, and they're a little bit difficult. The items are in different orders. So it's just going to challenge you in a new way. Back in the day, when this is the only game you had, you really felt like you got your $50 worth. If you could play through the second quest... I have never played through it either. Until this playthrough, I took a stab at it. I was like, you know what? I'm doing a podcast. We're going to talk about this. Let's have some substance. Uh, So the overworld... Uh, right off the start, I just farmed bombs and rupees. I uh, played the money gaping, uh, money making game like I did before. Used safe states. Bought the blue ring. Couldn't find any heart pieces. Uh, those things were moved around, so I ended up having to go into the first dungeon with the wooden sword. It's in the exact same location, so the wiz- withered tree. Uh, wasn't too hard. Uh, got to the end, got stuck. Used every bomb I had, trying to find a bombable wall. Went out, repeated in the next room, repeated in the next room. I finally had to pull up a map. It was in the very first room that you had to use the bomb. And so I started at the end and worked backwards. I should have started at the beginning and worked forwards. So stupid me. From that point, it was pretty simple. Uh, you got the boomerang and you fought Aquamentus. So very similar to the first one, except the bow was also in the first world dungeon. I missed it. Didn't really need it. Uh, for about the next hour of the game, I... I looked literally everywhere. I went, I found, got to the graveyard. I battled through Death Mountain. I went through the forest. I went through the hills. I went through the other forest trying to find the second dungeon. And it was nowhere to be found. Like, I was like, oh, they must have met, missed it. And it's just, no one ever talks about it. And I tried, I bought a bunch of bombs and like bomb random cliff sides. I, I couldn't figure it out. I don't know why this didn't dawn on me. Like the one place, obviously the last place I looked, right? It's just like when you yeah. lose something. Um <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh yeah, it's it's actually the first screen. It's where you got the no, it's uh it's where you got the it's by the shop by the lake where you got the blue ring on the first quest. Right. But because I had used the guide to say, hey, go to the up to the top right corner where the money making game was to find the blue ring, I didn't have to look there. So I guess that was my bad. This one was also fairly simple. You got the whistle. You fought Gleok. I lost uh, about six times with only four heart containers. I just never got lucky. I didn't get any heart drops. There was this one room with three or four iron knuckles or dark nuts that I sat there and like would try and fight only to die. And then I realized that the door was always open on the bottom of the screen. So I wasn't even like, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't like queuing, queuing the next room. Wasting your time. Yeah. Can't get a drop. (laughs) Yeah. Every time I went through, I'd, I'd lose. Like I had started with three, I'd be down to one heart and then I had to get through like two more screens and then to Gleok and I'd die again. I was just like freaking out. It was probably the fifth time I finally was like, I don't have to fucking kill these dark nuts. Do I like so stupid? I have little things in these games. Uh, so, th- so then I used the map to buff out on heart containers for the third dungeon because, like, I was struggling. I was like, I'm not going to be able to get past the second dungeon uh, without using a guide or something. The level three was where the second dungeon was. So on top of the hills in the forest, you had to use the whistle to enter this one. I found it very straightforward. No, no map. Got through it in one try. You got the magical boomerang and you got the dodongos. Dodongos are these little... Uh, kind of like triceratops looking guys that walk around and you just drop a bomb in front of them they eat it they blow up uh, if you can get them along the wall it makes it super easy from there i used the map again to find level four it was on the lost hills mountain path and instead of going up up four times you have to move or find the power bracelet and then move one of the rocks on the right to reveal a like a hidden a hidden staircase in the ground. And two of the heart pieces are found by you're on a screen, no prompts, use the whistle, a staircase appears. There's no bushes like uh so then I looked ahead in the walkthrough and I said, "Hmm, what kind of obstacles are coming up for old Mickey Rutschman? You know, like what I, what, what am I going to struggle on here? There's a room you need to pay 50 rupees or one heart container." To, and to get out of that room. And I was like, nope, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> fuck this game. Like, I was like, 
I had I had 80 or something, but I was like, I know that it's a reoccurring thing. And at one point, you need something like 250 freaking rupees or a heart container. Just to go and, through. And you, you never get it back. Like, it's you go into that room and you're look. The guy doesn't kill. I think the only way you could not pay is if you... Sh- stab the old man that you sometimes find his uh his fires will shoot balls at you and you could die and then reset and read to try it again but otherwise you're doomed that's stupid so i hate the second i hate the second that's quest <laughs> yep. you gotta pay yep farming rupees is like one of the worst oh. fucking things in these games yeah save states and the money making game make it a little bit more tolerable but even then it's it's still painful mm-hmm. All right, so that was kind of my second quest uh, experience. First memories of this game, I have nothing. Like, I never, I don't remember this game ever as a child. Uh, I think my first experience with Zelda was Link's Awakening. We had that on the Game Boy. It wasn't until Ocarina of Time came out on the N64. Like, that was kind of the first Zelda game to me. That's funny, because the only reason I know about Link to the Past, which is a Super Nintendo game, is because of a high school, or a elementary school friend that had a Super Nintendo with Link to the Past. And I didn't know that you never had an experience to that. I was like, man, that was like the best game. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, it's not a Link, a link to the Past. Uh, I remember a couple friends. So Mark Kale had it. Uh, there oh, was, okay. I remember being in small town BC, as I like to refer to it. A friend came over and like we beat through the first level. And I, I'm used to at this point either driving around as a, in a cart as Mario or jumping as Mario. And now there's this green kid with a sword and there's rats in a sewer or something. And it was just... Yeah. I was very and like we had stormed a castle the very first level and I was like man this game's intense but that's for the link to the past podcast the first time I think I saw the NES like Zelda 1 was when they released it on the Game Boy Advance or they had remember they brought out the Game Boy Micro that could play the advanced games I remember seeing that and looking at it was either that or Metroid and I was gonna buy one of them I, I kind of feel like I opted to get the Oracle games instead for the Game Boy Color so yeah like it wasn't until 2009 I played this for the first time and kind of sat there with the guide and built up my quote-unquote muscle memory. Nice. Uh, my current thoughts on the game, this game is a lot of fun. Uh, I do enjoy the open overworld where it's not like an o- open overworld like a Skyrim is where you can just do anything. You can spend 100 hours in that game not doing the main quest, right? Like you can just walk up yeah. mountains, help guys fight uh, zombies in their family tomb, take out uh, people on horses, fight bandits, never really get anywhere. Whereas this game is a bit more structured. There's only so much you can do and explore. Uh, So I kind of like that, that it's a little bit more contained. And I like just playing things out of order, you know? Like, I could see maybe in a couple more attempts couple more tries trying a no sword run you know like going and getting the candle wait how do you get money if you don't have a sword there must be a dun- there must be like a place where you can find like it's a secret to everyone and somebody gives you rupees then you must have to go and buy play the i don't know so, so now i'm kind of interested and i kind of want to watch a couple of videos and see if i can try it so like I that's <laughs> that's where i'm at in this game is i'm kind of at that point where i'm like i kind of want to try something new like i like it um i think that's the progression is you beat the game you get to know the game and then you're like i want to challenge myself so i'm at that stage uh with this game where i want to challenge myself i'm um played it once i Honestly, like, I'm not the best at these games. I'm more of a first-person shooter RTS kind of guy. So my natural ability has never really been here. I've, I've, give me a racing controller or a racing steering wheel or a controller, and I'll put myself sideways around a track quite well. I don't know. Like, this one, this game's really fun. Don't get me wrong. Like, if you're that kind of, t- kind of person, I've just never really big, been too hardcore into adventure games. I, I do think that I should play, like, Zelda 2, because especially now that I've played, like, Legend of Zelda 1, and I've played Link to the Past, and I've played Link's Awakening, and I've played Oracle of Seasons, and oh. the Ages 1, when that first came out. Uh, it's like, I've played, like, every single game, and I still haven't even turned on <laughs> Zelda 2. If if you would like, I'm going to try and play. Actually, I'm, I just started Zelda 2 this morning. If you'd like, come back on for Zelda 2. And, yeah, let's play that game and discuss it, because I think it gets a bad rap. It has a very special place in my heart. This is, like, the third time I've talked about this on this podcast. Right. Really excited to play that game. If, if, I, if Wind Waker isn't my favorite Zelda game, it might be Zelda 2. I'm the outlier. I'm the Zelda fanboy that likes Zelda 2 as my favorite game. Yeah. All right. So that kind of wraps that up. Uh, so we're going to do a new segment here called 
Are you buying it? In this segment, I dive into a theory or oddities in the game, and then I'll give you my take, and I ask, are you buying it? Uh, you can play at home as well. If you listen to this episode and you want to leave us a response, send us an email. I'll read back the answers probably on the next episode or Twitter or post on Facebook, any of those things. Uh, I imagine I'm going to get so popular after these two great shows that we put out that I won't be able to get to everyone's uh, questions and comments. So I apologize in advance. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's what happens when you're famous and, and you know. And, it's very successful. Yeah, very internet famous. It's it's, it's tough. So, uh, so just internet money. For example, uh, something we missed kind of from the last game that I probably should have went over, Super Mario Bros. 3 is a play. So this theory says that Super Mario Bros. 3 is a story that's being told, but it's a play. Some of the exa- or some of the reasons for this is there's a red curtain that comes up at the start of the game. At the end of the game, when the game is over, it lowers. It The bo- base always kind of looks like it's you're on some type of platform or a stage. There, all the back set pieces kind of look like there's like little screws in them. There's hanging down platforms, and you always exit stage right. Are you buying it? It's on a scale of one to ten. I'm sitting like a six. Okay, it's tough, it's tough to say honestly because like yeah, there's there's the whole curtain thing, and like in hindsight, looking over the history of Mario games, you're like, okay, well they've done things like Mario Party and Mario Basketball and Mario Soccer. Why wouldn't they do a play? And why why would the play just be exactly as they would do it? But everybody's scripted, everybody knows their part, and everybody's like okay with it. So Mario and Bowser and Peach and all the Koopalings all got together and they're like, ah, fuck it, let's put on a play, guys. Yeah. Like, that makes perfect sense. My, my, I guess I'd be more of a, like a three or a four. I think it's just the. Uh, artistic style they went for was kind of that theatrical play looking thing Be- the reasons I think this is because if you look at Super Mario World when- at the end of Super Mario Brothers 3 Bowser falls into a pit at the bottom of the pit he builds his Koopa clown car so he could fly out of the pit all the Koopa kids got together on a pirate ship or uh, sorry an airship flew over to Dinosaur World crashed and then inhabited and started wreaking havoc. And just because of the continuity between those two games, I don't think you can say Mario 3 is a play without saying the whole Mario universe happens as just one staged event. It's just a story. It's obviously a story. It's a video game. But I don't think the the, the characters in this world live together in perfect harmony. I, I think it's literally just the, desi- the design they were going for in that game. Two points. The opening of Mario Art All-Stars has... Yep. People cheering. Yep. So why the fuck would they have people cheering if maybe that was just some aesthetic thing that they just wanted people cheering? So when they when you turn on Mario All Stars, it goes uh, and everybody all cheers, and then when you select Mario Three, that's when the curtain comes up. And you're like, huh? So is that or is that just something they're like, ah, oh, just kind of works aesthetically? My other point is. Does Mario 3's geography couple with Super Mario World? Oh, hold on, sorry. Uh, I think either froze or something. Uh, can you just repeat that point? Um, my second point was just how does the geography of Super Mario World and Mario World Super Mario 3 kind of line up? No. Or are they supposed to be like just different continents? They're different continents. So Dinosaur World or the world of Super Mario World is they went on a vacation and like a little air balloon if you watch if you've ever played the uh, advanced version of Super Mario World. At the beginning uh, Mario, Luigi, and Peach are in a little balloon and they're traveling across the ocean. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Alright. Uh, so let's Going to let's do some things on Zelda. Um, this is the big one. I, I might even go grab my uh, Hyrule Historia for this guy. The Zelda timeline is accurate and just wasn't retconned into the game lore. So w- maybe for the next game, I feel like we've already talked a lot for this, so I won't bore you with it. Uh, maybe I'll post a picture of what the timeline looks like, so uh, if anyone's interested in listening to this, they can check that out. But basically, the Zelda timeline says every game in the Zelda universe takes place on one, well, one quote-unquote timeline. Personally, I feel like they had no idea what was going on when they made this game. They just wanted to make kind of a high fantasy, medieval type game. Due to the religious symbols throughout the game, I don't think they had or had any feeling that the whole uh, Triforce, like the goddess lore, uh, existed when they made this game. I... Well, there's, there's the truth, and then there's the truth. Yes. <laughs> to quote um, 
freaking that Simpsons character. What's his name? Lionel Hutz. Lionel Hutz. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching The Simpsons right now. <laughs> uh, so, like, it makes sense the way it just, I don't know if it just happened to work out this way, but I feel like there was a writer of Starbucks, or er, Starbucks, you can tell I'm hungry, of uh, Legend of Zelda, and maybe that guy has literally worked on everything, and maybe that guy has literally this entire time been like, I'm going to make these fuckers fit no matter what. But in reality, they're, they're individual games, and they just happened to like line up, and they're just like, let's slap this on it. Yeah, that's fair, I guess. And basically, the fans did the heavy lifting for them. Yep. Really, like, in all honesty, like, they just basically took what the fans did and were like, ah, uh, let's just slightly tweak this, call it official, and it's done. Yeah, I could see, I guess I could see that. Like, if there was one kind of, one guy who had kind of a, like, a loose what the story should look like, and this is what this game is, how it fits. Uh, but if you look at the, like, little intangibles in each game and the differences, I just don't buy it. Yeah. So are you so are you buying it on our scale of what a ten? I'm at like a uh, like a two on this one. I think it was just retcon. Yeah, I'm gonna be a little bit more generous. I'll go three. All right. To live dangerously. Okay. Uh, so let's just this is kind of more of a blanket statement. Uh, so the Christian symbols in the game was there supposed to be Christianity in the world of Legend of Zelda? My take on it, from what I can tell. The big parts where you see the cross is on Link's shield, and the fact that we get a, a magic book, or sorry, a book of magic, which was once called, or if you look at the Japan version, it's called the Bible, right? So shields, crosses on shields, and the Bible kind of makes it look like Christianity. My take from what kind of what I've read is when they were building this game, they wanted that high fantasy medieval field. Most of the time, if you looked at knights, they have crosses. They have a cross on their, like, armor or their shield so i think that's where the design kind of came from i think it, okay it may have been christianity-esque but it's zelda for the zelda world of christianity so it's just supposed to represent a religion that resembles christianity not like this is christianity okay but- so yeah, because like in Zelda two, you'll see the graves, uh, like you go to a graveyard and there's a bunch of crosses everywhere because what's kind of that universal symbol that somebody is dead? It's a cross on the ground, right? It's yeah. not saying like we believe Jesus once existed in this world. It's here's religion. It's exactly yeah. It's just supposed to be a symbol of religion. Like if you were playing Pictionary and you wanted to show off, if if, if it was Christianity, what's the first thing that you would do? Draw a cross. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I had a note here. Uh, it was more of the source material was of religious nature, and that's what has the impact on what we see in the artwork. So, uh, in my mind, is is the, the religion of Zelda Christianity? I'm going to say that's probably like a one or a two. Yeah, yeah, I'll go two. All right, and the final point I have here. Um, oh no, sorry. The, Let's go back to that. Plus, Ganon was a blue pig. If it was Christianity, he would have a pitchfork and have a red face and have red horns. It'd be the devil, right? The, the, yeah. So, uh, so just, just be, and they changed. He wasn't even a pig. They were like, they, that's they were like, that's literally a dude, and he turns into a pig. Yep. Like, come on, if it's gonna be, it's either gonna be a man with horns, yep. who's a goat. Yeah, uh, and then the last point I have uh, is the first dungeon, so the wizard tree by the lake, is actually the Deku tree from Ocarina of Time. So in the Ocarina of Time, there is three endings. According to the timeline, there is one where the hero is successful, and he is an adult. No, sorry. Yeah, there. Uh, three. there's three timelines. There's one where he is unsuccessful so at any point you die in that adventure a whole another timeline exists there's another timeline where you're successful but you get sent back in time as a child and you live out your life as a child and then there's the other timeline where you're successful but you you know what i have no idea how the zelda timeline works <laughs> I'm, I'm staring at it so i'll help you cheat okay um you're almost right the only the last one is you're successful, um, but it's the adult era. So oh, yeah, his, okay. His adult Link gets sent back. So yes. that entire t- timeline continues. And yes. then there's the story where he is successful, and he's a kid, and the Majora's Mask and everything starts up. Oh, I and see. Then, so, then so, the adult timeline, so the adult timeline is uh, there's no Link. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, 
in the version where you are unsuccessful, that very first one that I hit up right on the head and I apparently know what I was talking about and then I had a stroke and kind of forgot. Um, <laughs> you are unsuccessful. Ganon takes over. The Great Deku True dies at the beginning. Uh, and instead of the Great Deku Sprout taking over and becoming the, the Deku Tree that we see in the Wind Waker, he comes in, kills that, leaves the old husk of the Deku Tree as kind of like a fuck you to the people of Hyrule. It sits for thousands of years, and it's the first dungeon in Zelda. Are you buying that? Well, I'll put it like this. If you buy into the whole, they actually planned out all this story, um, yeah, absolutely. But in reality, it was just a will, a tree that they were like, ah, oh, that's going to be the first dungeon. And then they were like, uh oh. And they need Ocarina of Time, so they came up with the Great Deku Tree. I'm not sure if they were like, if at that point they said, this is that first tree. If that is... If that's what they said, then yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'm sitting closer to a 7 out of 10 than I am not because they, like, when they first did Ocarina of Time and they added the tree, where did they get their inspiration? That's my, uh, that's my question. I don't know. It's a pretty common trope. Like in Mystic Quest, you go inside a giant tree that talks to, uh, there's some other RPGs, like, like, Legend of Mana or something. There's a tree that you kind of go inside its mouth. So it's a fairly common trope in video yeah. games. Like, it's, yes. Um, it's just weird that it would they'd both line up first twice. Hey, there you go. Uh, so you're more optimistic than me. I'm going to give that one like a like a two. All these, apparently, I just think all these are just bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I think I just look well, at the. To be honest, most of them are bullshit. That's true. Uh, just like how Luigi's dead and Luigi's mansion. That one's creepy. You ever seen him hanging from the ceiling? Oh, yeah. It's a cool screenshot. Uh, all right. So that was... What the hell? Are, Are you buying it? Yeah, it was it's so well named. I, I don't know why I forgot. Uh, yeah, so looking at that, uh, finally, I guess I'll ask, did we miss anything? Um, yeah, actually. We totally glazed over the music. Okay. Uh, oh, the fact that this might be the only video game franchise that has, like, the iconic song at the very beginning, the... Dun, 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 has it's been an ever overworld over, over, over theme huh yeah huh just completely overlooked that one yep that's true um also when you pick up when you get items the, dun, 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 dun. yep yeah Huh. Those are kind and of like that's like that's a huge part of Legend of Zelda. I I work in a bank and I hear people's cell phones go off. You'd be surprised how many text messages are the da 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 huh. or some Zelda variety. Like people like people there's Zelda fans all over the place and it'll be like a forty year old man where or like with a briefcase and you're like that guy's a Zelda fan. <laughs> oh, well, the Zelda game came out 27 years ago, so if he's 40, I mean, he was 13 when it came out. Like, he, that's right in his wheelhouse, right? Yeah, and like, and, but it's funny. It's like, people are like that. People like to have their cell, their, cell, oh. their personal cell phones or whatever customized. And yeah, you'd be seriously amazed how many times I hear that or like a Pokemon sound. Hmm. Pokemon's actually kind of popular, which is kind of still blows my mind. So, so what you're telling me is that 40 year old man. He had two options. He could either play adventure and grow up to be Ernest Klein and write Ready Player One, which is just a terrible book. I think my theme is I'm just going to bash Ernest Klein on every episode. Or he's like, "Hey, why don't I play a game of that's actually good and maybe we'll stand the test of time and play Zelda?" And now he grew up and he's got a briefcase in Zelda, so he made the right choice, I guess. He's, and he's clearly successful because he's going to the bank and not robbing a bank. Huh. Interesting. All right. Well, that was a long one. Yeah. We'll break that into two parts. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'll break this into two parts. Uh, edit it out. We might be a little short on time on the first one. So I also feel like I turned. You could, you could probably chop my rant or when the rant starts and then just like put in the your closing bit and where we can always record, re-record how that kind of lines up. No, it's, I'll just cut it. Uh, I have a little speech feature on my mic that says mic off and when you were talking there, I went to turn it off so you wouldn't hear me breathing and I saw this like, like, like no audio on Audacity and then I turned it back on and went, Bleh! and there was, so there, I think you're going to be talking at one point and it's just going to be like a dead section. So I might, I might get to that point cut it say edit in my part like hey i'm just gonna cut you off there uh we'll end this time we'll take it off make that an episode and then kind of pick up again where you're talking on like the other end of that thought and just yeah. ha and have like a welcome to podtendo blah 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 and it's like we're gonna carry right on from where we were last episode and just let you breathe right into it and go from there cool cool 
Thank you for listening. The Podtendo podcast was produced by Mick Rutschman. You can contact Podtendo on Twitter at Podtendo Podcast, email us at podtendo at gmail.com, or check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash podtendo. The music of Podtendo was used without permission and is property of Nintendo.